Romans 12, we're going to look at verses 4 through 8, looking at the key activity of a surrendered life. Now, in this 12th chapter, we've been looking at the most important ways that you respond as a believer. So chapters 1 through 11 explain what God has done. Chapters 12 and following are explaining to us what we need to do, how we need to respond to what he has done. And so we've looked at this issue of presenting our lives as a living sacrifice to him. That is the primary issue of how we should respond. And then we are commanded not to conform ourselves to this world or to the values or morals of this world but we're to be transformed within so that we can serve the Lord and find that perfect will of God. But that requires me to be humble, to humble myself under the mighty hand of God. That's what God requires of me. So that is the key attitude of a surrendered heart. Now we want to look at the key activity of a surrendered heart. Which is what? Well, here in verses 4 through 8, Paul explains here are the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and he encourages us to receive our gifting and find our place in the body of Christ. This is the key activity of a surrendered life. So let's just read verse 4. He said, For as we have many members in one body, But all members do not have the same function. So we, being many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith, or ministry, let us use it in our ministry. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Now, what is this key attitude, or excuse me, activity of a surrendered life? It's service. It's finding your place of service in the body of Christ. Now notice right at the end of verse 1, he says that we're to present our bodies to the Lord. Why? Because it is our reasonable service. So this is our reasonable response that requires the attitudes and the behaviors that we've covered in these first three verses. But here, Paul wants to make very clear to each and every one of us that we are a part of the body of Christ and that service to one another is how we serve the Lord. Now, that is a key issue. This is one of the primary ways that you serve the Lord is you serve one another and you minister one to another with the gifting that God has given to you. And each and every one of you in this room has at least one gift, and God ha- wants to take that gift and use you in the body of Christ. Now, how do we know that serving others is the way we serve Jesus and the way we serve the Lord? Well, in Matthew 25, 40, Jesus said that one day he is going to declare to each and every one of us on judgment day this. He will say, assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. So whatever you do to the brethren, you are doing to him. So if you serve others, Jesus counts that as serving him. Now, that's a powerful truth, and it's an essential truth to understand. Now, there are many ways that you serve God. That is literally 
a whole nother Bible study. We could take a tangent this morning and just go off on that particular issue. But we, we don't have time to do that. All I want to say to you is that if you want to look at this issue, just look at the word ministry or service and just study that word through the Old and New Testament, and you will find a numerous issues that relate to serving the Lord. You serve the Lord through fasting. You can serve the Lord through prayer. You can serve the Lord by teaching or evangelism or giving materially or financially to others. I mean, there's a multitudes of ways that we are counted as serving the Lord as we serve other people. And so this is a subject that I would, I would encourage you to do and to, to study on your own. Very powerful. You have to remember, though, today that your primary way of serving the Lord is to present your body as a living sacrifice to Him. That's where it all begins. Romans 12.1, that's where it begins. You will never look for your place in the body of Christ to serve others unless you have first bowed your knee to Him and submitted your life to Him, offered your life up to Him. When you do that, when you see Him, I believe this is the first thing that you will think about. is Lord, how can I respond? Now let me just show you this in just two examples in the scripture. What is the first thing that Paul said when he recognized who Jesus was when he met him on the road to Damascus? When the Lord confronted him there on the road? It says in Acts 9.6, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, Arise, go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. And I believe the Lord will tell you what you must do as well. Have you heard his instruction to you as to what you are to be doing for him? Because I believe that is an essential thing. Another example is the prophet Isaiah. When Isaiah has his vision and he sees the Lord high and lifted up, he sees the angels of God surrounding the temple and he, he is broken in humility and sees his own sin. He says, Lord, I'm undone, I'm unclean. And the Lord takes a coal and, and places it upon his lips and cleanses him. Then he hears these words in Isaiah 6, 8. The Lord says, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, This is what Isaiah declared. I said, Here I am. Send me. You see, that is the response of someone who sees him, who knows who he is, what he has done, who has been cleansed from the coal from the altar. When you see that, and you see him as he truly is, that's what's going to motivate you to service. You're going to say, Lord, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to serve you? Because I am the recipient of great mercies. So that's the context that we find this text. So why should you serve God? Because it is your reasonable service. Verse 1. It's the most rational response for anyone who has seen the great mercies that God has bestowed upon him or her. Very powerful. So what are the keys that he establishes in this particular text? Verses 4 through 8, there are four very specific keys that Paul establishes so that you can serve God in an acceptable way. Because that should be your desire to serve the Lord in an acceptable way. The first is described here in verses 4 and 5. He says, For as we have many members in one body, but all members do not have the same function, so we, being many, 
are one body in Christ. So do you see yourself as individuals connected to the one body of Christ? That's critical. Because you see, if you're a believer, you are connected to that one body. But do you see yourself in the body? Or do you just see yourself as just some nameless Christian that nobody knows, nobody cares about, nobody thinks about? Or are you someone that God knows your name? You see, God knows them and has named every star in the heaven. So He knows your name. He knows you individually. That's why He says here, we're individuals connected to this one body. The Bible declares that He is in you and you are in Him. Now we always think about Him in us. But the reality is, is Paul's is saying here, look, you're in Him too. You're in His body. So Paul uses this example of a physical body because we can relate to that very easily. We understand how individual fingers and hands and arms and, and every part of our body is connected to the body as a whole. And each one of those individual members, the eye, the nose, the mouth, the ear, the fingers, the toes, every aspect of your body is really an important part of your body. Without it, well, you don't know how important it is until you don't have it, right? I mean, when you get, as you grow older, you realize things don't function the way they used to function. I mean, I'm telling you, what is the matter with me? I, I get dizzy, I, I can't grab on, I'm not strong. I mean, boy, that, this arm, this shoulder, is I, I can't use it like I used to. Then you realize, yeah, that shoulder's pretty important. And so every part of your body is essential, and every one of you is essential. Now look at this and the way Jesus described it to his disciples in John 14, verse 16. This is on the last night before his crucifixion and his resurrection. He describes for the disciples, he's going away, and he declares this. He says, I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it neither sees him nor knows him because you, but you know him for he dwells with you and will be in you i will not leave you orphans i will come to you a little while longer and the world will see me no more because of his ascension but you will see me because i live you will live also at that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. See, Jesus is making it very clear to the disciples that this is what they need to remember. They need to remember, I am in you, and you are in me. You are in my body. You individually are a part of this corporate body of Christ. Across this globe, in every country, in every city around this world today, there are believers. There are believers that are a part of his body, that he has called, that he wants that relationship, that one-on-one -on -one relationship with. If you see that you're in him and he is in you, you're going to naturally offer yourself to him as a living sacrifice. That's what you're going to do. You will refuse to be conformed to this world. And you will be transformed from within because He is living inside of you. And He is transforming you from the inside out. So this is really the beginning. This is where everything begins. And this is where He begins to live inside you, changing you, 
and then he gifts you. And all of a sudden, as a believer, you begin to understand. Your eyes are opened and you realize, well, this is where God is calling me. This is what he wants me to do. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to do it with everything I have because that is what is pleasing to him. This is my reasonable service to him. And so when that takes place and you have that one-on-one, -on -one, you see that you are a part of him and what he is doing on this earth. Then you come to the second point. The second issue is notice right at the end of verse 5. He says we are members individually, but members of one another. So that's the second issue that is essential for a believer to see. I'm not only a part of him, I'm not only just a part of his body vertically, but I am horizontally a member of you. You see, I'm part of you and you're part of me. And we are members one with another. Now, if you want to do a, a Bible study to see your responsibility to others in the body of Christ, just look up the words one another. Just do that study sometime. Just plug that into your Bible study program on your computer. And I'm telling you, you're going you're gonna to have a Bible study that will awaken you to your responsibility and how you are connected and how essential you are to other people in the body. So, do you realize that you affect other people? That you affect other believers and you can affect them for good or evil? You can either build up one another or you can tear down one another. You have that effect on other people. Now there are, again, many passages that we could look on at this, but let me just show you just one where it makes it absolutely clear why it is so important for you to see this horizontal responsibility. It says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 25, Paul said, put away lying. Let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor. Why? For we are members of one another. You see, if my physical body lies to the rest of my body, then I'm going to have a problem. I mean, if I took a, a knife and slit my, my arm wide open, and I had no pain, and my body lied to me and told me, there's nothing wrong. Well, I could bleed to death simply because my body is lying to itself. But I am connected with a central nervous system that communicates pain. And pain is what tells me, work on this, get this fixed, take care of this. Put some pressure on that and stop the bleeding or you will perish. So every believer needs to speak the truth with other believers. So when somebody asks you how you're doing after service today, and you're doing terrible, if you say, oh, fine, fine, you're lying. It's just like... Your body is cut open and your, your body is not telling you that there's a problem. You're not fine. But you need to ask for help. That's what prayer is all about. That's why we pray one for another. There's one of those passages that comes up in that study of one another's in Scripture. Pray one for another that you might be healed. So you have a very powerful effect upon other people's lives if you will pray for them, serve them, give to them, strengthen them, encourage them, whatever the case and whatever the need is. So you have to first see that you're connected to Him and He is in you and you are in Him. And then you have to have that horizontal. You need to realize Look, I am a member of 
others. They are part of me. We are a part of the body together. And we have an effect upon each other. And then thirdly, you need to see that you are given gifts to use in his body. The gifts of the Holy Spirit. Now he's going to give us seven examples of different gifts here in just a moment. We're going to look at these. But these seven gifts are not the only gifts. These are just seven of probably 20 plus gifts that are clearly delineated in the scripture. So do you know what those gifts are? And do you know which one of them? Because to every individual, every believer that is in him and that he is living inside, he has given at least one gift to you. So do you know what that gift is? If you say to me, no, not really, Steve then you need to make a study of this as a believer. You need to ask the Lord to show you what your gift is. What is your gifting? And then you need to exercise that gift according to grace. So by grace, he gives you these gifts. Notice verse 6. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. So the word gift and grace basically come from the same root word. So the gifts are gifts of grace. I can't deserve the gifts of the Holy Spirit. I can't be good enough to get them. I can't do anything to obtain them. They are simply received by grace. God gives them to you just like the gift of salvation. Not because you're such a good person or you're such a great person or you're such a smart person or anything. It is simply because he loves you and he wants to use you in his kingdom because he knows you're a finger and you're a part of his body. You're a part of him and you have life because you are connected to the body and he wants to use you. And I'll tell you, if you cut your thumb off, you're in big trouble. You're not going to be able to grasp anything or very little. And so you have to see your place in the body of Christ. And seeing what that gift is, is how you begin to find your place and your purpose in the body of Christ. Now, putting this this passage here, verse 6, together with verse 3, is really important. Notice, he says in verse 3, I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. So notice he says, according to the grace given to me, don't think more highly of yourself than you should. So humility and receiving your gift of grace is essential because that is where grace is dispensed. That's how it's dispensed. It's dispensed to a person who is humble before God and they see their need. I need your enabling. Now, many times I have seen people in the body of Christ and they think that they are so gifted that God just can't do without them. And they are very arrogant. And they, they are constantly telling you how gifted they are and how powerful and anointed they are and so on. And you just kind of just go, let me out of here. I, wanna, I don't want to be in this conversation. Now, that individual thinks more highly of themselves than they should. And I guarantee you, God doesn't need not one of us. He doesn't need any of us. But he wants to use each and every one of us. He doesn't need me, and he can use somebody else in place of me. He can use you, or he can use somebody in place of you. If you have an arrogant attitude, you will be taken down. I guarantee I've watched it happen, I've seen it happen, and it's not pretty, and it's a warning. It's a warning to me. 
Now, for people who are on the other side of that spectrum, we've, we talked about this last week, those who think more highly of themselves than they should, and then there are people who think more lowly of themselves than they should. They usually say, they're not telling you how God can't get along without them. They're telling you God can get along without me. He doesn't need me because I'm nothing. I'm nobody. I have no gifts. I, I can't do anything. That's pride too. That's rejecting the gift of grace that is upon you. When you try and achieve the gift of grace, it's pride. When you reject the gift of grace, it's pride. Both of them are wrong. You have to be right in the center, humble of heart, that acknowledges it's a gift of grace. And when you do that, God will bless you. He will use you. He doesn't need me, but by his grace, he uses me. And by his grace, he will use you as well. So, be very careful. If you reject his gifting in your life, and you don't pursue his gifting in your life, then you will miss out. You're the, going to be the loser. God is going to find somebody else to use, but you will be the loser. Now, all I can say to you is if, if you say to yourself, if one of the reasons why you came to Christ is because you saw the meaninglessness of life, if you saw what you were doing and what your life was like, and you said, this is worthless. I mean, am I going to live and die? What's the purpose? Well, then you want to find your gifting in the Lord because that's where you will find the greatest meaning and the greatest purpose that you will ever find anywhere in life. That's where it'll be found. Because you will say, wow, this is my calling. This is my gifting. And God will use you. And you will sit back and you will just say, Wow, amazing. Now, all I can say to you concerning your gifting is you may think to yourself, God could never use me to do that. That is probably just exactly how he will use you. Because when you say, oh, he could never use me to do that. Well, I'll tell you, I look at myself and when I became a Christian, the very last thing on my list would ever, that I would ever think about would be pastoring and teaching in a church. The very last thing on my list. So whatever's last on your list, watch out. <laughs> because the Lord may choose to use you in that way because it's all a gift of grace anyway. So what is Paul's point? He's saying, receive your gift. Use the gift that God has given to you. Now, each of the encouragements here in this, these verses four through eight are all in the imperative in the Greek, which means these are commands. These are not options. These are commands. He's saying, you need to see yourself in this, in your place in the body. You need to see yourself in your relationship with others. You need to see that this is all a gift of grace. And you need to see what that particular gift is and then use it. Exercise it. This is critical. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 28, he says, Since we are receiving a kingdom which cannot be shaken... Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear. So let us have grace. You should each be praying, Lord, I need grace to serve you acceptably. Remember, God resists the proud and he gives grace to the humble. So humility is truly critical here. So fourth... What are these gifts? How do you receive these gifts? There are seven of them here in our text, and we're going to look at these individually. 
But for those of you that have never taken the gift questionnaire, we have it out on the information table. And I would encourage you, go through the gifts of the Spirit and answer the questions there, which will help you to understand where and how the Lord may want to use you. If you've never done that, pick it up on your way out today. So each of the gifts that are encouraged here and commanded to be used by those who receive it, each of these verbs in this particular text are in the present tense as well, which means if you've got this gift, you need to be exercising this gift on a regular basis, on a, on a continual basis. So what are these gifts? First, prophecy. Notice he says, having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given, to us, let us use them. That's the command. Let us use them. If prophecy. Now the if means that not all of you are going to have this gift of prophecy. This is a supernatural gift to communicate God's word, a spontaneous communication of a word from the Lord. Now this particular gift is powerful. It, I have seen it exercised in many different ways, many different administrations. I've seen it used in teaching. I've seen it used in uh, home Bible studies, in church services, where God gives a person a word and they speak that out spontaneously. Somebody in that room is touched and ministered to by that word. I've seen it used also as a confirmation. I can't tell you how many times people have spoken out verses of Scripture or portions of Scripture that are going to be in the Bible study. They haven't seen this outline up on the screen. They don't know that, that I'm going to cover that verse of Scripture, but that verse has been given as a confirmation to someone in that assembly. When a person reads a verse of Scripture, that is forth telling the word. So forth telling the word is, a, is another form of prophecy. So if the Lord puts a verse of scripture on you, hopefully not a whole chapter, <laughs> just one verse. If the Lord puts a verse of scripture on your heart, speak it out because it's going to minister to someone. It's a powerful gift. Now both men and women can prophesy. It says in Acts chapter 2, verse 17, It shall come to pass in the last days, says the Lord, that I will pour out my Spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. So I'm looking for the dreams about now. Anyway, so men and women, your sons and daughters can prophesy. The Lord can speak to you. It requires an, an exercise of faith in this gift and every gift. Notice he says at the end of this, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. So he doesn't mention this after each and every gift because it's a given. You must exercise a gift by faith. You can't do it any other way. And it's done in in a proportion of faith. That means everybody has a different proportion of faith. Now, a smaller proportion of faith will be less effectiveness in that particular gift. A greater portion of faith will be greater proportion of success with that particular gift and usefulness of that gift in your life. So you have to ask yourself, how do you get greater faith? Well, it comes from using the faith you have. If you don't use what God has given you, then you will not grow in your faith. Let me show you this in the scripture. It says in Mark chapter 4, verse 24 and 25, Jesus said, take heed what you hear. With the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. And to you who hear, more will be given. So if you hear what God says and you use and apply and put into practice and act on what God has given to you, then he will give you more. If you don't act on what he gives you, 
then there's no reason to give you more. Notice the last part of that in the next verse. He says, for whoever has, to him more will be given. But whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken away from him. So use it or lose it, basically. That is the, that's the bottom line. Use what God has given to you. Or there's no point for him to do anything more, for him to give you any more. So if you want to grow in your faith, use what the Lord has shown you. Speak, minister, serve, do whatever he's telling you to do. And as you do, that will cause you to grow in your effectiveness. Now, prophecy can be even used to speak of future events. In Acts chapter 11, verse 28, there it says, Agabus stood up and showed by the Spirit that there was going to be a great famine throughout all the world, which also happened in the days of Claudius Caesar. So this particular prophecy Luke records here was fulfilled further on down the road in Claudius Caesar's life or time frame. So this famine actually took place. Paul, of course, remember he, was, he went through the churches. In fact, at the end of Romans, he's going to say, I'm coming, will you take up an offering for the poor in Jerusalem that are a result of this particular famine? So it's essential that you see this incredible gift. Everyone begins with a measure of faith, but will you use the gift and the measure of faith that you've been given. If you do, more will be given. You will grow naturally in your faith. The second gift here he refers to in verse uh, 7, he says, or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. Now the word ministering here, or ministry, is literally a word that just means service. Now, all of us are called to serve. We have a reasonable service that we are to render. But there are some people that have a gift of service. Now, these are individuals in the body. That you know who you are. Uh, we have told you, would you please not sign up for this thing in addition to what you're already doing because you're going to burn out. So a person who has a gift of ministry is that individual. It's the person, they, they want to serve everywhere and anywhere. That's their heart. That is the heart that God has given to them. That's where they're gifted. They are a gifted servant, truly in ministry. There are people who have a ministry, such as a deacon that fulfills this area in Acts chapter 6, verses 2 through 4. It says, The twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples and said it is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. There's that word. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. Now the word ministry there is a word that means service. So there's the service of tables and then there's the service of the ministry of the word. Both are specific giftings within the body of Christ. In Romans 16:1, notice Paul said, I commend you Phoebe, our sister, I commend to you Phoebe, our sister, who is a servant of the church in Centuria. So this particular woman most likely carried the epistle of the Romans and carried this message to them. And so, but she is called what? A servant of the church. All of us are servants, but what is that particular servant service that you are called to? Notice in Ephesians 4, 11 and 12. Paul says that Christ himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of what? Service. 
ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. So all teachers, all apostles, prophets, pastors, anybody in the body of Christ, they are given as giftings to help you find your particular place of ministry and your particular place of service. So a ministry gift is to help others find their ministry. It's that simple. The third gift is the gift here of teaching. He says, and he who teaches in teaching. Now, every one of us in this room is to teach someone at some time because you're a disciple of Christ. Every disciple is to teach other disciples. In Matthew 28, verses 19 and 20, there Jesus said, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. So, you are commanded to teach others. But there are some of you that are really, truly gifted, supernaturally, to teach the body of Christ. And as you, you're not going to even know that until you start teaching others. As just in a general sense, you teach your children, you teach other people, you may disciple someone that you have led to Christ or that has just come to Christ and, and is at your place of employment. Start teaching them. Start teaching them. And all of a sudden you're going to go, wow, I really, I really enjoy this. I really like this. And it'll just naturally, the Lord will flow and bring you into that place of gifting. Then the fourth gift, exhortation. He says in verse 8, he who exhorts in exhortation. Now again, all of us are called to exhort one another. It declares in Hebrews 3.13. He says, exhort one another daily. So every believer is to exhort or to encourage others. But some of you have a supernatural gift of exhortation. That supernatural gift of encouragement, of comfort, literally the word in, to exhort means to comfort someone or bring them alongside of you. And I, I love the, just the picture of somebody putting your arm around another individual, bringing them into your side when someone is struggling, they're hurting, and you just put your arm around them. That's exhortation. That's comfort. This particular word, exhortation or comfort, is used in 2 Corinthians 1.3, where it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, and the God of all comfort, or the God of all exhortation. So he is a God who comforts and encourages you. Now probably one of the best ways to discern somebody that has a gift of exhortation is you are just naturally drawn to that person. It's the person that you think about, that you want to go talk to when you're bummed when you are struggling, when you're down, you think, oh man, I, I want to talk to her. I want to talk to him. Every time I talk to him, they just, they just build me up. They just lift me up. They encourage me. That is a person that has the gift of exhortation. Now, this is one of the things that I think you can do to help others find their gift. And that is when you recognize a gifting in another person, you need to tell them that you recognize that gift. So if you recognize the gift of exhortation in someone, you need to tell them, you know what, that word of exhortation, that encouragement you gave to me just changed me. It really encouraged me, just helped me. I just got me over that hump that I needed to, to get over. If somebody gives a word of prophecy and it speaks to you, don't be silent. Go up and tell that person and share with them, look, that really touched my heart. That ministered to me. Because that's going to help that person realize, wow, 
the Lord used me there. If nobody says anything, you'd think to yourself, was that effective? Did it touch anybody? Did it minister to anybody? So you can help others find their particular gifting. Very important. Now, fifth, the issue, the gift of giving. Notice, he says, now here Paul changes in verse 8, and he adds a little postscript to each of these gifts, which is quite interesting, which just gives you a little more insight into how to exercise this gift. He says, he who gives with liberality. Now, giving, again, everybody is called to give. But some people are supernaturally gifted in giving. In Luke 6, 38, this is what Jesus said, Give, and it will be given to you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. But with the same measure you use, it will be measured back to you. So there's that little phrase that we looked at earlier in reference to hearing and using what God has given to you. Here he's saying the same thing is true with giving. So the same way that you give is the same way that you will be given back to. You see, there's a way that God gives back to you eternally with an eternal reward. And he gives back to you temporally as well, right here, right now. He uses other people to bless you and to return what you have given to them. So giving is something all of us have got to do, but there are certain individuals who are supernaturally gifted in giving. They have a compassion for other people. They have a, a way of helping and serving other people that make them feel special, not a burden. You know, a person can help you and it's like it's, you make, they make you feel like it's a chore for them to help you. And then there are people who just help you and you just go, wow, that, you, you just made me feel incredibly special and loved. That's a gift. It's a gift of the Holy Spirit. He says that you should give with liberality. Now, this liberality is a word, it's a Greek word that literally means sincerely or generously. So you should give in a sincere way. People will sense your sincerity as you give if you are gifted in this way. In Proverbs 22, 9, it says, He who has a generous eye will be blessed, for he gives of his bread to the poor. And so this is one way that you can give, giving to the poor. So those are, there are different ways that you give. You can, you can give to the Lord, which is your tithe. You can give as far as almsgiving, which is giving to the poor. And you should not give to the poor what you should give to God. And you should give to the poor what God directs you to give. Because he is going to direct you to give above and beyond your tithe. I guarantee you, he will. Because he is a giver. And he gives to you more. More than you can ever give. And the fact, the more you give, the more he will return the gift. You can give in several different ways. You can give of your time, your treasure, your talent. I just was referring to your treasure a moment ago. But you can give of your talents. A special way to give. You can give of your time because your time is precious as well. You, there are many ways that you can give to others. And then, number six, leading. He says, he who leads with diligence. Now, the word lead here literally means one placed in front to lead another. So this was, would refer to anyone who is leading any ministry within the body of Christ in any way, shape, or form. It could be leading a Sunday school class. It could be leading as far as in church government as an elder or as a deacon, as a board member, 
leading is something that is, well, again, we all lead people in general. We help others. We take a step forward. But this particular gifting is where a person is required basically to get out front of an issue. If a person is a leader, a true leader, then they will lead. They will look ahead of, and see what the need is and they will take action. If you're in business and you are the owner of that business, then you have to lead. If you don't lead, that business is going out of business. And so if you are a part of the church and you are leading any particular ministry, you need to do this, as he says here, with diligence. Now, the word diligence is a Greek word that literally means in haste. It means get to the program, get, get with it, and get with it quickly. Haste, do it quickly, which shows an eagerness and a willingness, not a grudging attitude. Oh, I have to, okay. Well, it's the last thing I think about. Okay, if I have to, I will. That's not leading with diligence. In 1 Peter 5, verses 2 and 3, he says this in reference to those leaders of the church. He said, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not lording as overseers. Notice, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, not as being lords over those entrusted to you, but as examples, being examples to the flock. So he tells them here, willingness and eagerness, that's the diligence that he's talking about, and love, not as being lords, but as an example and a servant. Very important. Now, this last gift here, the gift of mercy. Now again, all of us are called to be merciful. You are to show mercy, show compassion towards others. But I guarantee you there are some people that are extremely gifted, supernaturally gifted with the gift of mercy. And that gift of mercy is, is applied in many different types of gifts within the body of Christ. It's, it's basically a gift used with other gifts to enable that merciful activity by an individual. Compassion. This is a person, well, they're the person that, well, they're gifted and they just have that ability to give that person the benefit of the doubt, that person that will work with them, work with somebody who is struggling, versus a person who just says, X them off the list. Cut them off at the knees. They're done. The other, the person with the gift of mercy says, no, I'm going after them. It's the one that pursues the lost sheep. You see, that's a person who has the gift of mercy. That's the person, well, Jesus, it says, that's why he ministered. That's why he came, because he looked out on the multitudes and it says he had compassion on them. That's why he was here, because he had the gift of mercy and compassion, because Jesus had them all. So these gifts are essential. Now notice last here he says, show mercy with cheerfulness. Now this word cheerfulness is an interesting word. Uh, Norman Vincent said this word should be translated a joyful eagerness because it comes from the Greek word from where we get hilarious. It's very interesting. I mean, you look the Greek word up, that's, that's, you, you can see the, the root word there, hilarious. So he's saying, I want you to give with a joyful eagerness a joyfulness about your giving and your mercy, not I have to, a grudging kind of attitude, but I want to do this. And so your attitude really displays the supernatural gifting of his spirit. It's powerful. So what's your gift? 
What is your gift? These are just seven of the multitude of gifts in the scripture. Which one is yours? And if you as a believer know what that gift is, the next question is, are you using it? Are you exercising that gift? I think that's an essential thing. So will you ask the Lord to direct your path and to use you in his body as he directs? Let's go to him in prayer. Father, we thank you that, Lord, you even want to use us, Lord. We are, we are just overwhelmed that you would, by your grace, want to gift us with anything. Lord, we thank you for the gift of salvation. And we thank you for the gifts of your Holy Spirit that you, Lord, give to each of us that we might profit the body of Christ as a whole. And Lord, I pray you'd, you'd open eyes to, today, open hearts and minds this week, this month. Lord, just how you have gifted us. Lord, help us to encourage those that we see those giftings in. Lord, help us to acknowledge them and, and help our brothers and sisters find their gift. And so, Lord, we believe you to do that. Lord, for those that know their gift already, Lord, I pray that you would, Lord, enable each of us to fulfill our calling in your body as your people. And if you're here this morning and you have not received the gift of salvation, that's where all of his gifts begin. And you can't really know anything that, of what I've just shared with you today until you've received his forgiveness and his salvation. If you know you're a sinner and you know that Christ has died for your sins, you believe that, then will you turn from your sin? Will you choose to turn this morning and choose to follow him and receive him by faith right now? If you want to do that, will you pray with me? Will you just ask him right now? Jesus said, you have not because you ask not. Ask, he said, and it will be given. Will you do that? If you will, pray now. Just say, Lord, forgive me. I acknowledge I am a sinner. I have broken your law. Jesus, come in, take over my life. I want to serve you. I want to follow you. Fill me with your Holy Spirit right now. Did you just pray with me? Are you just praying with me? If you did, will you acknowledge that you prayed with me here by just lifting your hand, a simple acknowledgement. Yes, Steve, I prayed with anyone here because we'd like to pray for you. Lord, we ask that you would just touch your people here today. As we come in faith, Lord, cause us to exercise our faith and to obey your voice and obey your calling. In Jesus' name. And we all said, Amen. Amen.